Guys, welcome back. I'm here with uh, his name is Scott Vori, and he's uh, he's the vice president of marketing at a little company called Western Digital. You may have heard of them. They're uh, you know a, a gigantic powerhouse when it comes to data storage and hard drives and you know just anything that you want to put a bid or a bite on. These guys pretty much may have something to do with the stuff that you're using. So I invited Scott to come on the show and talk about data storage solutions for photographers specifically. It's a question that keeps coming up over and over again, especially now that we're getting these awesome cameras that do you know larger and larger raw file sizes as well as video and 4K and you know higher than 4K resolutions that create these gigantic files. The dirty little secret is, yeah, you can create all these awesome files, but then you got to store them and that storage has to be bulletproof because, you know, we're creating irreparable or irreparable or ill, ir, what's the word I'm looking for? Memories that cannot be recreated. <laughs> <laughs> Memories. All right. So Scott, welcome to the show. How are you? Great. And thanks for having me on this week in photo. No, oh, you're welcome. It's a it's a pleasure to have you on. So this, like I was saying in that that little intro that I screwed up there, the uh, you know data in general is what we all do, right? We're digital photographers, and the digital equals data. You know whether you know in the old days we were shooting JPEGs, and it's okay, yeah, I can just buy more floppy disks, you know. And now you get to these raw files that are gigantic, and we get these cameras that can just shoot seemingly forever and fill up a raw card in a blink of an eye and now there's video and audio and all that stuff added on top of it. So let's talk about that, the problems. That's it's kind of a, an outline of the problems that are facing digital photographers. Is that, is that the same kind of things that you're seeing from your side of the market? Yeah, generally we hear the problems fall into three categories. One is capacity. You know, just because the file sizes are getting so huge, whether you're talking about raw files, whether you're talking about 4K video or even beyond, and, uh, you know, people are used to buying a 500 gigabyte portable drive or, yeah. or maybe a terabyte, and that's just not enough these days. Yeah. Um, the next thing is bandwidth. You know, with your workflow, you go back to the studio or maybe you're editing in the field. Once you cap capture these huge files, how can you... Uh, quickly and efficiently edit them and, and, and move your work on. Right. And, and then the and then the final area is is security. You know, either from a backup perspective or or safety perspective, uh, even location matters because people are, are are concerned about having all of their assets in in one spot in one location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the whole the whole cliche of having all your eggs in one basket, but. Right. Eggs are replaceable. Data is not replaceable, right? So then, so then, let's let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, I was I was in Paris, uh, geez, uh, a couple about a month or so ago, and I brought one of your drives with me. The the passport, you know, it's this amazing like bulletproof drive that you know I plugged in. All I had with me was my mirrorless cameras. I had a MacBook Air, and I had that drive for all the media and storage because I was shooting 4K video and all this stuff. And in the old days, I wouldn't have brought an external drive. I would have just put everything on my hard drive and been done with it. But the capacity of my hard drive now is smaller because it's a you know it's 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 a solid state storage in there, so it's faster but it's slower or faster but smaller. So I needed an external drive to it. So there's that level. I want to have you address that you know that level of solution, the portable piece of it, mm -hmm. and then. When in your ideal workflow for photographers, when they get home, do they continue working from that drive or should they export onto something else? What do you think? How does that work? Yeah. So when you're in the field, we have uh, different solutions depending upon what your speed and capacity and, and, and quite uh, honestly what your economics are. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. So we have uh, the uh, Passport for Mac. Uh, which is a, a, a basic, portable, very small uh, USB hard drive. And then we have the, um, the Mac Air, which is much more stylish, designed to kind of go with the MacBook Air. Uh, but if you really are, and this is 
really aimed at for, uh, photography professionals. You're worried about both bandwidth and you're worried about the the safety of your assets. Where we have a new product, and I think you've played with it, is the is the My Passport uh, Pro. Yes, yeah. And this is the first of its kind. It, it, although it's a portable drive, there's two drives in it, as you know, and it's Thunderbolt cable built in, yep. and it's powered through Thunderbolt. So all the other kind of RAID portable solutions, you had to, you still needed to plug them in somewhere, which I don't understand that because if you're out in the middle of nowhere, where are you going to plug it in? It doesn't work. This yeah. thing is powered off of the computer through the Thunderbolt cable. You get the fabulous speed, Thunderbolt speeds. And you get that data redundancy if you want it. Uh, so really, the ultimate in the field solution for a photographer, videographer. So um, let's let's talk about that piece of it real quick. The okay. the that RAID piece because photographers yeah. hear that acronym and we get scared, right? Because like, okay, RAID. You know, there's RAID zero, RAID one. You know, what does it all mean? Which one should I be using? Is there a trade-off? I hear one's faster than the other. Right. Which one should I use? Can you demystify what RAID is and how and sure. how it impacts us or we as photographers? Sure. First of all, whenever you're talking about a RAID drive, that automatically means that there's at least two physical drives in the enclosure rather than one. Mm -hmm. And you uh, can choose how you you use those two drives. You can either use them um, in a, what we call a spanning mode, which means you just get twice the capacity. Mm -hmm. So if you buy, uh, you know, th this product is, is, let's say, two four terabyte drives, you can put them, span them, so now you have, your uh, computer sees it as a one eight terabyte drive. So one giant pool of storage, right. but it's comprised of many separate drives. Right, so if that's what's important to you, that's what you do. Okay, uh, there's another, uh, that's, and the, the way we recommend using the product, and most products actually come pre-configured this way, is what they call RAID 0. Yep. And what that means is that when you're writing your data, when the PC or the Mac is writing your data, it's actually writing, it's striping, and so it writes a little piece to one drive and a little piece to the other, yep. essentially doubling the write and read performance because it can do it at the same time. Okay. And so that's RAID 0. Now, that, what that doesn't give you is the data redundancy, which is RAID 1, which means that I actually write the duplicate data to both drives, and therefore I protect myself in case one of the drives fails. I've got a complete copy on the second drive. Okay. I think I, so RAID 0, RAID zero uh, is, what, like you said, what most drives come pre-configured as, and that's for speed because most people need speed. So I'm going to be using RAID 0 if I'm editing video and all my files are stored on that drive or say my Lightroom library is stored on, I want that stored over there and I need it right. to be able to read it fast back and forth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a RAID 0. RAID yeah. 1 is backup so that if one of those drives, say in the, in the case of the Passport, one of the drives in that unit takes, you know, dies, Fails. then there it's still safe. I still have my data available, but it's not as fast as it would be with with a RAID 0 solution. And and what about capacity wise? So is it with RAID RAID 1, you're you're halving the capacity. So Correct. if there's two say two 500 gig drives in there, you don't get 1000 gigs, you get 500 gigs, right? Exactly. Okay. The other thing I'll say about RAID 0 and that performance is that's the only single drive a configuration that you can buy that truly takes advantage of Thunderbolt, the speed of the Thunderbolt technology itself, mm -hmm. because um, drives drives have a max write speed, and so by being able to split the writes between the two drives, essentially you're dis essentially doubling the write speed of the drives, and uh, now you can really start to take advantage of that extra bandwidth that Thunderbolt provides. Well, let's talk a little bit about Thunderbolt. So uh, I'm curious. So we, Apple uh, has been a pioneer in these, you know, kind of pushing the, the ball forward in terms of interfaces, you know, um, some that the industry adapts and some yep. that they don't, you know, yep. like the lightning bulb, yeah, you know, all this stuff, right? Some right. are Mac only and will probably exist in the Mac world only, which is okay for people that are in that ecosystem. But mm -hmm. then there are some that straddle the field, like, you know, USB 3 and... 
you know, Firewire was one of them, you know, and I'm sure you're intimate with all these interfaces. What about Thunderbolt? So is is Thunderbolt uh, a, is that a, a uh, connectivity transport that we can ex- expect to see across the board? In other words, if I invest right now heavily in Thunderbolt gear, and then one day I decide, I'm on a Mac now, one day I decide, you know what, I'm switching away from the Mac, I'm going to Windows. Will I be able to find a Windows machine that supports Thunderbolt, or will I have to rebuy everything? Well, I don't think we're going to see Thunderbolt penetration on the PC side of the house. Uh, I think you know most of your uh, viewers are, are, are Mac users. Yeah. Yeah. You know, certainly uh, Apple dominates the editing, the, the professional editing markets. Yeah. And a lot uh, of them. I don't know about most. You know, it might be there's, you know, there, it's definitely a Mac heavy audience to this week in photo listeners. It's definitely Mac heavy just because it's okay. photography is creative. But, mm-hmm. you know, I'm seeing more and more people that are you know, becoming either platform agnostic because everything's in the cloud, you know, and right. they're using Lightroom and it doesn't matter where they're running it, you know, and so they don't really care that much about the operating system as they did, say, 10 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think what we're going to see is that the devices, the, the high-end devices like, say, the Passport Pro or our uh, Velociraptor Duo, which we'll talk about in a second for the for workflow, We'll see those start to come out with actually both USB 3.0 and uh, Thunderbolt together on on every product. Excellent. Okay, yeah. so you so, have your choice. So you're you're future proof. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You use what you want to. Now, is Thunderbolt still the fastest way to get your data from one, from point A to point B? Yes, it is. Okay, so if you can do Thunderbolt, no matter what the 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 yes. capabilities that you have on the device or your computer. Do Thunderbolt at this exactly. point, right? Okay. And and the other thing about Thunderbolt, uh, you know, kind of getting into you, the question you asked before is, what about when I get home? Yeah. Um, we do recommend that people back up or transfer their assets from their portable drive to a desktop drive at home. You just want those multiple copies. Mm-hmm. One of the great things about Thunderbolt is daisy chaining. I mentioned the limitation of the speed of the drives. With Thunderbolt, you know, you can daisy chain these things four, six drives in a row, and now your data is the speed is phenomenal. And you, you can even you can buy different performance drives that you use one as kind of your caching drive that that's the one I'm working on in the project that's open, and then when I close it, I archive it onto a different drive that may, that I can archive it, and I didn't have to pay so much for it. Yeah. And you, you can have those all in the same daisy chain. So it, it's, it's really, a, it's a good technology. So for, the, for the, the folks that are like daisy chaining, what's that? So daisy, just, to de, just to define what it is, it's, it's when you have, like say like on my computer, I've got one, maybe two Thunderbolt ports on it and they're both occupied. But the mm-hmm. devices I have plugged in to my computer each have more than one third Thunderbolt uh, plug on them, you know, so I can connect one drive to my computer and then another drive off of that drive and then another drive off of that drive and go up to, I don't even know what the limitation is, probably more than I'll ever use, but you can, you can daisy chain or chain multiple drives together in sequence. But my question is when I do that, and this is me again, this is me going old school. So I'm going, I'm going back to the days of SCSI. You remember SCSI, SCSI? We had daisy chaining back then, and we could daisy chain our scanners. You could plug in this thing, that thing down the line. You had to put a little Terminator on there so the computer knew when the end of the chain was and all that. And then there was performance impacts when you did that, though, because things had to be in a certain sequence. And if they weren't, there'd be all kinds of gremlins that would show up. How does daisy chaining today compare and contrast to daisy chaining back, you know, in the Flintstones right. era? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question because one would, you'd think logically that, okay, well, why would I put one behind the other? Because then everyone's going to get in the way and yeah. every, I'm going to be writing at one-sixth the speed or reading at one, one-sixth of the speed of six drives. But actually, Thunderbolt is the opposite. The drives are operating as if they're in parallel. So while I physically have plugged one drive after the other and this thereby save those ports on my Mac. They the commands are op, are going independently to each of the drives. However, I have maintained uh, how many I have chained together, and 
uh, with good uh, software, I can actually write to those as if those were RAID drives as well. It, that same thing where I write a piece of, of the, the photo to one drive and another piece of the photo to the second. Uh -huh. So I'm getting that, that dual three, four times the speed improvement. I didn't know that. So y you can do like you can almost simulate RAID zero yes. with daisy chained Thunderbolt drives across physically right. separated drives. They don't have to be in the same unit. Right. Wow. See, I didn't <laughs> I did not know that. See, you know, we get stuck in these old metaphors like the old scuzzy mind of thinking, you know, the way of thinking with with how daisy chaining works. And I didn't even. It didn't even occur to me that that was even possible with with. Well, it wouldn't because you would think that it would actually get slower. But, yeah, yeah, but it actually is the opposite, and it, it's they. It, so that's the one the one type of of uh, configuration that we we find for workflow works very well. Yep. The other thing is I mentioned kind of mentioned this thing. You've got the trade off of price versus performance. Right. One of the things that affects performance is the speed of the drive. We offer a, an extremely high-speed drive in our product called the Velociraptor Duo, Thunder, Thunderbolt Velociraptor Duo. Yeah, tell me about Very that. High RPM drive. It's it's Duo, but uh, it actually only you can only get it up, up to two terabytes um, be, it, because of the price. But yeah. what what you do is you use that as kind of your caching drive. Mm -hmm. That's, you put your project on it while you're working on it. And so you've got really fast I.O. with your uh, workstation in the drive. And then when you're finished, put it off onto, uh, let's say, a, um, a uh, Duo for Mac, mm -hmm. one of their desktop products that is also Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt Duo. So you, you would use the, the Velociraptor Duo, this high-speed... Uh, desktop unit say if I'm, I'm editing video like I'm gonna be editing this interview I would put that on the duo do my cutting add the intros and all that stuff and then when I'm done with it I'd move it off to a slower drive and then the next interview that I'm editing goes on to the Velo Velociraptor it's my exactly. working storage space exactly okay and what is that what is the Velociraptor duo run these days like speed uh, price wise um I mean, I'd have to check. I think it starts around six ninety nine, seven ninety nine. Okay. okay, yeah, that's still reasonable, especially if you're if you're in this line of work. You're not a hobbyist, and you need that level of performance. Then, you know, that's time is money, right? So you got to spend it somewhere. Right. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about different. So we talk. We kind of touched on strategies like bringing, you know, say the Passport Pro out into the field and back home and then offloading. What are, are there any other like tips and tricks you can give us in terms of how to segregate that data? This interview has been like gold so far. Cause like, right I, I, I had no idea about half of the things that we're talking about. Now I want to go try them. So what else, any other things you want to throw in there? Um, I think we, we've kind of covered the, th the things that, you know, you want to start out, what are my needs and what's my budget? Yep. Uh, because you can get good capacity and even that, that will work on both uh, Mac and PC sides with a USB portable drive. Yeah. And so if you're just going for terabytes and you want something that's very tiny, will fit in your briefcase, is not a bunch of extra weight to bring, that's the way to go. The, the next thing is, okay, I need to step up my performance. And so you want to look for a Thunderbolt pro uh, product, mm -hmm. which we recommend. And then... Uh, if you're doing editing in the field, that's that's where that becomes perform that becomes critical. Is you, you really want to do Thunderbolt if you're going to do editing in the field, yep. and then that the high end is not only I'm editing in the field, but you know I I really care about this data and I don't want to lose it. Yeah. So um, then I go to a RAID setup where I'm doing the automatic data duplication to the two drives. But there's a uh, the the final thing, and we do, we we started to touch on this earlier, but haven't yet. Is okay. W it's great that I I have protection for for my data, but as I've automatically mirrored it on two drives in the same enclosure. But what if my house burns down? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So that's the next thing that we urge people to to think about and. Uh, you mentioned the logo that I have. That's for a product we call, have called WD My Cloud. That yeah. is a it's a hard drive, but it plugs into your router at home instead of plugging into your Mac or your PC. 
The advantage of that, of course, is that all your, your Macs and PCs on the home network can see it. But more importantly, this thing, you can see it from the field with your iPhone or your iPad or you can anywhere on the internet with your Mac and you can be sending photos to it. So this is another way to get that, that redundancy. You create a kind of a centralized library for yeah. all of your assets at home. When you're out there in the field capturing it, uh, you get back to the hotel at night, transfer everything via the overnet to the drive right then and you can even share it to other with other people just send them a link and they can look at it on the drive at home so if you're on a project and you've got people back in the studio they can be watching your work looking at the dailies just by you sending them links to the, your drive at home and then you just plug that into your router or does it sit on your wi-fi network or it, 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 well because it's plugged into your router it is on your wi-fi network okay okay so it's connected your your home computers and everyone that's connected to that network either wi-fi or plugged in can see that storage pool, but then if I'm in a hotel, say in New York, and I connect to the Wi-Fi there, I can still see that drive. How do I see the drive remotely? Uh, you just log on okay. to our website through your browser, mm -hmm. and we re re redirect you to um, your drive. Okay. And, but the and the, but the data is not on our servers. It's on your drive. We're just helping you make that connection when you want to log into your drive. Yep. We also have apps for uh, the iPhone and Android smartphones and tablets that uh, you can do this over 3G as well. Wow. So uh, whether you're on Wi-Fi with your phone or you're on 3G, you just bring open the app. It goes over the Internet and automatically finds your drive, and you're looking at all the photos Showing them to you can be showing your your portfolio to people on your on your iPad, even though you don't you don't have it with you. Right. So there's no more. Okay, I, these are this is a this is a series of photos that I want to I want to be able to show in my portfolio. Let me copy those out and transfer them over to my device so that I can show them when I'm remote remote or some other thing like that. This sounds it sounds almost like a Dropbox or that kind of solution, but it's yours. It's on your network and you're not restricted by their terms of service and bandwidth exactly. limitations, etc. In fact, we call it a personal cloud because it's like having the cloud, but it's at home. That's really cool. And when yeah. is that is that available now? It is. It's been it came out uh, last October. Very cool. Awesome. And then now that goes from uh, two to six terabytes. Mm -hmm. If you uh, you know, but if you're a serious uh, videographer or photographer, of course, you know your assets are much larger than even that. Yes, of course. We've got some pretty beefy, um, you know, professional level uh, cloud products that are very similar to that. It's called the MyCloud EX2 and the EX4. As you can imagine what that means, it's got two drives or four drives in it. Yeah. And and those go up to uh, 16 terabytes. Wow. Depending wow. upon the capacity. And w the final thing is those products, because they are more professional level, they come with a feature that if you, you can buy two, put one in your studio and one in your house or one at your parents and one in your house, and they will automatically back up to each other. So in case your house does burn down. Yeah you still got everything and it's all automatic happens in the background. See that that's the key right there because I feel like at home right now I'm okay aside from you know I I feel like I need that velociraptor duo. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so and I need the cloud thing to plug in, but the missing link from my backup strategy is having off-site storage and part of the the issue with exactly. doing that is we as photographers like we said at the beginning we generate a lot of data all the time in fact after this i'm off to I'm another shoot. connection a little bit so i'm not hearing it uh oh so i was saying we as photographers generate a lot of data right so the fact that we generate so much data means that putting it in the cloud is difficult Right. And having it and doing that offsite redundancy or having an offsite copy of our data is next to impossible when you're always creating data. Right. Exactly. Exactly. OK. Yeah, I think we may be losing the connection on Skype a little bit. So let's let's uh, let's close this off here with just what's coming next in the Western digital lineup for photographers that we should care about and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, we do have a new product that's uh, coming out on September 3rd. Um, it's under embargo until then. Okay. Uh, but it's a uh, 
portable wireless hard drive. So it actually, you don't plug it into your computer at all, it broadcasts its own Wi-Fi network and you connect your iPad or your phone or your uh, PC, your notebook to it via the Wi-Fi network. And what's really cool for photographers is it has an SD card built in. So you've got this thing you're carrying it around. You take your pictures. The card fills up. Did you have to plug in another one? No. You take it out. This thing will automatically copy them off you and delete it if you want. And you stick in the card right back in. All right. I need that too. See? And <laughs> what's cool about it too is that you know a lot of these new DSLRs, how they have FTP built into the camera. You can yeah. FTP the images. Okay. You can FTP to this drive while you're shooting so you take a picture and it'll automatically FTP the image instantaneously to this drive you know the rest of your crew is there with their iPads looking at the drive so they're looking at the pictures on the iPad literally as you're shooting them and, and that's it's directed hard drive so I'm seeing the crew is seeing images pop up in a directory and my model and I are sitting there working and exactly. over here it's like a wireless tether with, right. wow that's yeah. really cool well, Scott, thank you for uh, for letting me pick your brain for a little bit today. I know you're a busy guy over there moving bits and bites. Nope, and my pleasure. Yeah, well, this is good. So where, where would you like the This Week in Photo audience to go to kind of get their brain around the new products that are coming out and all that good stuff? So the best place is WD.com. Just WD.com? Yes. Excellent. All right, Scott. Thanks okay. a lot. All right. Talk okay. to you soon. Bye. Yep. Take care.